everyone. I'm delighted to be with you today. And I think over seven classrooms with us, which is really exciting. I can't wait to share some of my research and hear about your questions at the end. So Joe, is this where I switch over to my PowerPoint? Absolutely, we're ready. Brilliant, hold on one second. And then hopefully, oops, need to go back to the beginning. Okay, can you see it? We got it, you're nice and full screen. Okay, hey, brilliant. So my research is really looking at plastic and how it's getting into the ocean. But what really interests me is investigating the not so obvious. So how is plastic getting into the ocean from ways that we would never typically consider? But let's start right back at the beginning and remember what a plastic is. And as its most basic components, plastic is carbon and hydrogen. And that's called a monomer, what you can see on the screen right now. And imagine a monomer like a Lego brick. If we were to put all of these Lego bricks together, all of these carbon and hydrogens, it creates a polymer. And this is the very basic structure of a plastic. And it's this structure, this polymer, all of these Lego bricks together that can make some really wonderful materials that have revolutionized our lives. And that can be carrier bags, shampoo bottles, toys, phones, even things that protect us. So it really is a wonder material. And the first synthetic man-made plastic was invented in the early 1900s and it was called Bakelite. And um, Bakelite was used to make radios. And to show that it still works, my nana, my grandma still has a Bakelite radio today. And this really boomed the whole plastic age. We can see plastic around us all the time. So it started with polystyrene after Bakelite, which you'd often see to make coffee cups, single use coffee cups, then polyester, which makes our clothes, PVC, polyvinyl chloride, which makes really hard pipes, polythene, which makes our water bottles, and also nylon, which is the bristles of our toothbrush. And I want you to look around your classroom right now and just see how much plastic is in there. It could be your clothing, the carpet, the computer you're watching this on. Uh, it could even be parts of a mobile phone to pens. It's really everywhere. But it's a victim of its own success. And this is a picture from something called Life magazine. And this is in the real mist of when we thought plastic was a fantastic material especially for single use items. And this family are throwing all of these single use items in the air because they're so excited. So have a look to see what you can find. I can see plates, spoons, cups. There's a lot of single use items there. But like I said, it's a victim of its own success because now a lot of these single use plastic items are making their way into the natural environment. And we're almost treating our natural environment like the ocean like a rubbish bin. But how did it all get started for me? Well, it was me when I was three or four years old with my dad. And I was really lucky that I grew up in a seaside town called Clevedon, which is in the southwest of England. And I've always had this massive love for the ocean. I just love being there and feeling its healing properties. And one of my most favorite things to do was to draw in the sand. And I'd take a pebble or a stone or a stick or a shell and I could draw in the sand for hours. And I used to love drawing pictures of animals or trains. And I think in this picture, I'm actually drawing a train. But I never remember any plastic on these beaches. Well, fast forward 20 or so years, and unfortunately for a lot of us, this is what we're seeing. And this is a beach near me in Cornwall, because at the moment I live in Plymouth. And my dog is in the top of the corner called Rhubarb. And I took him for a walk on Easter Sunday. And I didn't expect there to be any plastic on the beach, but it was just after the storms. And unfortunately, it looked like multicolored confetti all over the sand, tiny bits of plastic covering the beach. And when I was younger in my past photo, I don't remember seeing any plastic on the beach because if I did, I'd have recruited it to be one of my paintbrushes to draw my drawings in the sand. But here you can see it's just everywhere. 
So from my beginnings of drawing in the sand, now I'm a marine scientist focusing on the sources of plastic getting into our environment, because I really want to see and be a detective of how it's getting there. So my research that I've done at university looked at the sources of plastic into the marine environment. And when we typically think of the sources, we might think of litter dropped in towns or cities, litter dropped at the beach, or even shipping materials lost overboard. But I wanted to investigate the plastic that's getting into our oceans from ways that we wouldn't typically always consider. So my first piece of research was looking at facial scrubs. Uh, facial scrubs used to contain tiny plastic beads called microbeads, and they were put into facial scrubs to act as exfoliants. So you'd wash your face and these exfoliants would get the dead skin off. But no one knew how many microbeads could be in one bottle. And remember that these are plastic. So you can see all of the different types of facial scrubs here. And the glass file at the front of the bottle shows how much plastic was in that facial scrub. So from our research, we found that up to 3 million tiny plastic beads could be in one facial scrub bottle. So when a squirts on your hand, there could be up to 10,000. So imagine you would be washing your face with tiny plastic particles, which would go down the sink, through the drain, and then potentially through our sewage treatment works and into our oceans, making it a big plastic soup. But what was exciting about this research? Well, it was really exciting to see how research can make a change because it made people discuss that plastic could be in our facial scrubs and taught us that people like you and me can make a change and we have a voice and a choice. So people started to not use these products and use natural alternatives instead. Then industry started to also listen and they started banning micro beads in their own products because they realized it was very unpopular and it was making people really angry. And then governments around the world listened as well. And our research influenced governments around the world to ban microbeads and facial scrubs. So it was really exciting as a scientist to see how my science was making a change in the world. And I went back two years later to test the same products that I tested previously, and all of them had removed plastic from their products, which was a great success. My next bit of research is looking at washing our clothes. And I want you to look at your clothes right now because most of them are made out of plastic. Can you imagine that you're wearing plastic right now? Because when I think of plastic, I think of a pen or a plastic water bottle or something really hard, but not my fluffy jumper. And to prove a point, this is made out of plastic. And when we wash our clothes in the washing machine and they're swishing and swirling about, tiny fibers can come off our clothes and like the microbeads go down the drain potentially through the sewage treatment works and then into our oceans making our oceans a big plastic soup potentially full of microbeads and fibers but i wanted to do research looking at different fabric types and how many fibers were coming off in a wash cycle so i can imagine that you're thinking of a typical lab as white lab coats and people looking at test tubes but on the screen right now, this is my lab, and this was my washing machine. And we very much have a love-hate relationship because I did over 200 hours of washing clothes. But I got some very interesting results. So the things that we tested were polyester jumpers, acrylic jumpers, and also polyester cotton blend jumpers. And we washed them in the washing machine. And this is what we found. So for a typical wash that you would do at home, about six kilograms, if I was to wash a load of polyester cotton blend jumpers, about 130,000 fibers would come off our clothes per wash. For polyester, it was more at 500,000 fibers and acrylic the most at 700,000 fibers. So imagine when you go home and you do the washing of your clothes, up to 700,000 fibers could come off your clothes go down the drain and potentially into our oceans, making it a big plastic soup. Now imagine that for your street, your town, your city, the whole world. That's a huge proportion of fibres going into our environment. But what was my next bit of research? And this is my most very recent research that came out in the last year. And I decided to test biodegradable and compostable plastics. 
because people, when they hear the word biodegradable and compostable, we often think that if they're in the natural environment, they'll disappear in a really quick time frame. So I decided to test this. And I tested a number of bags from really top shops in the UK. And I cut these bags into strips. And then I sewed the bags into this mesh structure. And as you can see here, this is us in uh, the lab, sewing them in and getting them ready for deployment. And then from these bag strips, I also deployed whole bags as well, just to see how they would deal in these environments. I buried them in the soil. And here you can see some of the strips just about to get buried. And some of the whole bags as well. I hung them outside uh, so they would get sunlight and all of the weather that would come with being outside. And I also submerged them in the sea. So this is the setup for the bags that are about to go into the ocean. So you can see the strips there and also the whole bags. And you can see the boats on the left and then you've got the pontoon and the water to the right. That's where I submerged the ones that were going to go into the marine environment. And I left these bags here for over three years. So the whole bags and the strips. And I analyzed the deterioration over these three years. But I took out samples at nine months, 18 months and 27 months. So I could have a look at how they were breaking down. And this is me pulling out some of our samples after nine months. And it got really heavy because it turned into a zoo of animals and seaweed. So it took ages to try and pull out these samples because they were just a giant mass of animals, which was really exciting to see. And as you can see, you can see lots of sea squirts and crabs. Uh, lots of seaweed as well, and I had to dig through them to get back to my samples. You can also see the red things there, which are starfish. I also had to dig them up, so I pulled them out of the ocean and I had to dig them up after nine months. And I also had to look at their breakdown for the ones that were outside. So what did we find? Well, for the ones that were outside, all of the bags after nine months turned into tiny, tiny pieces which we call microplastics, which are plastics less than five millimeters in length. And that's because it's getting something uh, from sunlight. It's being oxidized. It means it's getting heat and that oxidization, which is needed to turn this plastic into tiny bits. It doesn't mean it's completely disappearing. It just means it's going into tiny bits. But for the bags in the sea, all of the biodegradable bags tested were still there after three years. So I don't know about you, but if I heard the word biodegradable in the natural environment, I would assume it would disappear in weeks, not three years. But the compostable one in the ocean did disappear within three months. And the scary thing is that these biodegradable bags could still hold, after three years, a full bag of shopping. And it was a very heavy bag full of beans, bananas, pasta, cereal, drinks. So it was a very heavy bag. But here I am holding that bag that's been in the ocean for three years and it's still a functional bag three years later. As you can see, that's me pretending that I've just come from the shops. Uh, biodegradable and compostable plastics are a solution, but a solution in their own circle where they might need to go to an industrial composter, which has really high heat and really high moisture that's needed to break down the materials. But we need to have better labeling and understanding of these materials because we're finding that for some of these plastic types if they're in the natural environment they're not behaving any differently to normal plastic so looking at all of my research from microbeads and cosmetics from washing our clothes and also looking at biodegradable and compostable bags it's created a lot of discussion and a lot of media attention and this is fantastic because it's teaching people like you and me that we have a choice and we have a voice and what we are doing does affect the ocean. By choosing a microbead free facial scrub, we could be stopping three million tiny microbeads from going in the ocean. From washing our clothes less regularly, we're stopping 700,000 fibers potentially reaching the ocean. So it's up to you guys now to be plastic detectives and to go and spread the knowledge about plastic in the environment and know where you fit in. 
I'm really excited to now be finishing my research with National Geographic and Sky Ocean Rescue, where I've been testing different inventions that will be going into the washing cycle to try and capture the fibers. Um, I wonder if I can show you actually. I'm actually in my lab and here you can see my washing machines. And that's where I've been doing all of the testing recently. So watch this space because we're about to say the results very soon about which inventions are really effective at capturing the fibers. And that's me sat on top of my washing machine so you can get a better view of them. And I'm also really delighted to be joining National Geographic where I've been traveling on the Ganges for all the way from Bangladesh and India, all the way from sea to source. And I'm part of this wonderful team of Bangladesh, Indian, UK and American scientists, storytellers, educators that are going on this journey so we can better understand how plastic is getting into rivers because all rivers lead to the ocean and we want to find solutions. So I want to leave you now with just something that I want you to remember and this mosquito is made by a friend and artist of mine called Rob Arnold and it's made out of beach litter. So you can see you have lollipop sticks, uh, earbud sticks, they have an inhaler which is making the main body of the mosquito and also a part of a bottle. But why is this important? Well I want you to remember that you can make a difference and if you think you're ever too small to make a difference try sleeping with a mosquito. <laughs>